What does that mean, a quantization of geometry? By a very strange coincidence, the word quantum actually pops up in the writings of Bernard Riemann in, around, in 1854, his famous inaugural dissertation, when he is laying down the foundations of differential geometry that were so important. Fifty in the years before quantum theory even emerged, right? Right, and he called the definite parts of a manifold defined by some boundary quanta. The only uh, time I've ever seen the word used that way, uh, but it's as if he saw ahead to when manifold space-time itself would be analyzed into quanta the way light has been an analyzed into quanta. So we know that was one of the great innovations of Einstein in the 20th century and Max Planck, that in the quanta we see things in discrete pieces and, and, and electromagnetic radiation through the photon is that. What you're saying is that even the, the space-time itself, the geometry of the universe could be quantized in so that space is not continuous the way we feel it to be? Right. In 1905, Einstein introduced quanta of light, the photon, it came to be called. And very soon after, he suggested applying Heisenberg's algebraic method, he calls it, to space-time. It turns out this idea that space-time is made of atoms, that they're atoms of space, goes back thousands of years. It's a part of Indian philosophy, uh, the Islamic tradition, or the Islamic scholastics. The Islamic Encyclopedia describes atoms of space, atoms of time, and atoms of matter. Mm. So it, it, it's not really a new idea. The, not, the revision of logic is kind of new, although even that resonates with Aristotle's attempt at a logic of change, a dialectical logic, that was much more interesting to him than the logic that everyone knows about. <laughs> What are the implications if, if what we think of as space and time are quantized and then come in, 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 in small pieces? I mean, we, we've sort of gotten used to the fact that, that atoms work and how they work, and, and even though there's so much space there, the electrons are pulsed, so things seem like they're hard, even though they're mostly empty space. We, 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 we can get our hands around understanding that. But, but, but how can we ever get our hands, uh, get our minds around understanding space itself? and time being not continuous. Very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, you practice first. There are really levels of quantum theory now. There's classical physics. Then under it is this more accurate, more delicate theory that we call quantum theory. And it, it seems very likely, I, I should say this has not yet passed peer review. <laughs> it has not yet been subject to experimental test. This could be pie in the sky. But I see a lot of internal consistency to this uh, suggestion that beneath the existing quantum theory is a deeper one which is even more quantum and has less commutativity, more order dependence, a, a fuller application of the revised logic and that in, Heisenberg and Bohr suggested. And in this deeper or deepest quantum theory, that space and time itself comes in pieces. Right. I call, the name was already provided by uh, uh, Professor Murnahan of Yale University back in the 40s. People saw everything was falling apart into lumps. Maybe time comes in lumps. Uh -huh. Let's call it the chronon. So like we have the photon for light and the graviton for gravity, we, we now have the, the chronon, chronon yes. for time. Right. And the, the, the we know how time. big that chronon is? We sort of know how big the photon is. Well, first of all, this idea that uh, space-time is quantized is not a new one. I mean, I can show you mathematical exercises of this kind. The, the oldest one I know of is actually due to Feynman, Richard Feynman. Mm. As, a, as a graduate student, mm. Mm. he made one of the first attempts at a quantization of space-time. Mm. And there's this constant, the chronon, <laughs> sticking out in front of all the equations. How big is it? Most of the people who do, who do play this game suggest that it's the Planck time, mm -hmm. a ridiculously brief time around 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And the, really the only reason for, for saying that is that if you look at the present constants of physics and ask what's the most fundamental time you can make, well the most fundamental aha, constants <laughs> we know of are H, C, and G. And Planck observed that if you put them together, you get this time, the Planck time. A tenth of minus 43 seconds. A H, C, and G meaning? 
H is Planck's constant. Yes. Can I say a little more about Planck's constant sure. before we go on? Yeah. Everyone knows E equals mc squared. That was one of the equations Einstein put forward in 1905. People don't know he had three energy equations in 1905 covering the entire range of physics. He had one relating energy to temperature with Boltzmann's constant. He had one relating energy to frequency with Planck's constant. Mm. And one relating energy to mass with the speed of light right, squared. Right. And E equals mc squared is famous, but E equals hf is much deeper. It's a much greater extension of relativity. Unifying energy and mass is nothing compared to unifying energy and frequency which is quite mind-boggling. And that's where Planck's constant that's comes That's where Planck's in. constant came in. And then the C is the speed of light. Right. And, and capital G is Newton's universal gravitational constant. What could be more universal? <laughs> and bringing those together. Gives you 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And that is your chronon. No, no I, I don't believe that. <laughs> I think Professor Wen pointed out that the vacuum was probably the worst misnomer in the history of physics. Mm -hmm. Nothing can be fuller than the vacuum. It should be called the plenum, really, <laughs> the fullness, oh. which is what Descartes called it, by the way. Oh. And if, if, as he suggested, you think of it as a form of condensed matter, matter isn't quite the word, call it organization, a word that Robert Laughlin is pushing in this connection, then typically organized media have many, many scales of length. A conductor has a skin depth, a coherence length, a lattice size, an atomic size, and so on. And they can range over many orders of magnitude. I'm sure the plenum has an equal large number of characteristic lengths. It just happens the one we know of, the one that got the most publicity, is Planck's time. OK, it might be the chronon. But for, I'm kind of optimistic. I hope the chronon will turn out to be so much bigger that it will show up in current experiments.